Welcome back to the Christ Community Church podcast, where we are diving into Sunday, January 28th sermon, The Hope of the Gospel. I am Ryan, the interim teaching pastor here. And I am Jana Michelson, the connections pastor. And like I said, we're going to dive into the message from Sunday. We are in week four of our Jonah series. I believe that's correct. We are. (laughs) The weeks are starting to run together a little bit, but only have gotten through chapter two so far. Yes, and uh, kind of an exciting part this last week. Uh, When you say the hope of the gospel, that's really why we get together for church. So um, it's an important message. Yeah, I should remind people, if you don't know, you're not familiar, gospel means good news. And so typically when we're talking about the hope of the gospel, we're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ, which is ultimately what we're being pointed to. And really just walking through Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2 and seeing how He's praying a lot of the gospel message. Maybe not all the gospel message, but a lot of the message. Yeah. Jenna, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually flip the flip the script on you and okay. I'm gonna put you on the hot seat for a Uh-oh. moment. So if you were to share the gospel, what are some of the elements, things that you would share in like a 30 second, one minute, you get your elevator speech gospel message? Uh I would have to be relational because I'm a relational person. So I would tell about how I received the gospel and use it as a story of I realized that my sin kept me from God, that there was a wall and I couldn't get through, and that I recognized finally that Jesus paid that price to um, die for my sins and that he rose again and that he is God. And all I needed to do is believe in him and that he did all the work. My good works were not getting me anywhere. And so um, I used to share the Roman road. Mm -hmm. And there are some verses in Romans you can share the gospel. But I find it's easier to share about things that I know because then I don't get so confused or feel put on the spot. Um, And... I leave some of the work to the Holy Spirit. I let them ask a question so I can share that piece about what I realized about my life and needing Jesus and then ask what they think. Um, and sometimes it doesn't lead to any more conversations, but. It's good. I think, I mean, I, you know, at the end of the message I kind of just shared, or even in the beginning and towards the end, I just shared that I think sometimes, and I know I do this myself, we overcomplicate yep. what we need to do. And yeah, it needs to be the Romans road or, you know, I have this bookmark in my Bible that has the gospel outline and ask these questions and it can lead to these responses. And then you share these scriptures and different things. And sharing scripture is important because that's that's the truth. But also you can share scripture in a way where you're not saying, hey, let me read Romans 3.23 and 6.23 and 10.9. And, you know, you can share what God has done and make sure that's truthful, but share it in a way of, hey, here's what God did for me and what God can do for you potentially but even just, I mean, even keeping it personal of just, this is what I've gotten to receive. And I think if we can twist it around a little bit, we can share the hope of the gospel in more situations because we're just celebrating who God is and what, what God has done in our lives and what we've gotten to experience. And that helps, I think, break down some of those barriers that come with evangelism of not having all the answers or worrying about what people are going to think or say or those different things. And I, I think you know, the gospel can be, you can, we can complicate it in many ways. I mean, it, it, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to sin and what Christ did and atonement and all these, you know, big religious words. And you t- start to explore all these things like that's, it's all good. That's all fine. But I think also you can share the gospel in very simple terms of like just John three sixteen. God so loved you, the world, they gave his one only son that if you put your trust in him, you won't perish but have eternal life and so we can keep it simple and we can also expand and just depends on how much you want to share i like that because one of the things you said that hit me too is you shared how sometimes we share religion Mm -hmm. we share church we share things that you know like um before this series we were going through the five solas and somehow we if if i get messed up in my own head and think it's about things that I need to know or uh, do or share appropriately in huge words that mean a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not able to even start that conversation, I feel like if I use words that don't mean anything to me, if I don't understand them, it's not going to create a conversation with someone. Um, And you need that conversation instead of just preaching. 
Yeah. And I think too, I mean, you know, it's a helpful exercise sometimes to think, how would I share this with a first grader? Mm. And if you can do that well, then you can probably share it with maybe slightly different wording, but keeping it simple for those who have never heard before or those who think it means something different than what it means. And so, again, we want to proclaim truth and we want people to grow in their knowledge and their relationship with Christ. But also, we need to start at the basics and start simple and move forward. And so how do we engage people in conversations? Some of that is just recognizing there's hope in the gospel message and we've received that and we can share what God has done in our life and why we feel this hope and why we feel this joy and why we feel just the love we have or the peace we have or different things. So I think sometimes it's just making it, like you said, personal, relational, sharing that story. But again, not overcomplicating it. Just, I don't have all the answers, but I know what Jesus has done for me. And I just want to share that with you because I'm excited and I hope you'll be excited with me. And I asked Jesus in my heart, May 17th of 1978, I believe, at a mother-daughter conference, and you weren't alive then. But it doesn't mean that I don't want to pray about the joy of my salvation being fresh to me now. And that's, I think, I was realizing is that if I'm not excited about what Jesus has done, like if that's old news, then I'm not sharing it. But if I'm recognizing, wow, like that grace is just amazing. Um, and David prayed in the Psalms that God would bring back the joy of his salvation. I think that is, you know, what those of us that have been, have been believers for a while want to pray for. Yeah, we need to sort of re-gospel ourselves over and over and over again to remind ourselves of the joy we have, but also to remind ourselves as Christians that, and you kind of said this earlier, I think this, this is a bigger conversation for Christians of it's not about me. It's not about what I did, but it's about what Christ did for me. And I think the, the temptation is to be like Jonah, where we don't want to share the gospel because there's people out there who don't deserve it because they don't behave the right way. They're not acting the right way. They're not like me. They don't know the things I know. They don't do the things that I do. And so we judge them based on behavior that is expected of followers of Christ because we have the Spirit dwelling within us and the Word of God. And so we feel like the gospel is not for them. But if we're re-gospeling ourselves to remind ourselves of the truth and the hope that we have, that it's in Christ and what He has done and His love pursuing us, and really we recognize the sin and the disobedience we have, then it's going to help us to view others correctly and to say, well, I didn't deserve this, but God gave it to me. And if God can do that for me, God can do that for someone else who I don't agree with. Or maybe I wouldn't give this to them, but it's not up to me. It's up to God. And if he freely gave it to me, I can freely share that with others. Well, and that's part of how you began some of the message was finally, after so long, Jonah finally recognized the presence of God. And you talked about how God chases us. All the time, God's pursuing us. And are we recognizing it? And then when we do, what are we going to do about it? So. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's an important place to start of knowing just at least a little bit about who God is. Again, we're going to continue to grow in that knowledge of him because he is God. <laughs> we're never going to fully understand him or know him. But recognizing that he is always there, that he is with us in Jonah in this really dark moment, in this really lonely moment, this place of desperation cries out to the Lord. And he says in his prayer, and the Lord heard me. And he recognizes that even in the belly of the fish at the bottom of the sea, God is there. And so whatever height or depth we go to, God is present with us. And that's, that's a, a powerful truth. And, and what a joy it is when you know the love of God and the grace of God to recognize that. Have there been times, uh, at least for me, I kind of forget that. Life seems hard and it feels like God is far away. Um, and I, I think that's part of the, the sharing too. Having people around us is... I need people to remind me that God's presence is always there. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had moments, especially like just in my prayer life of thinking, not that, I don't, I don't know that I've had a moment of thinking God is not there, but in, in a sense, I think that God's not listening, that he's not as present as I would like him to be. 
And one of the things that's helped me, honestly, just in my prayer, is having a prayer journal. Uh, because as we talked about re-gospeling, it helps to remind me of how God has been faithful. And I can look and see, oh, God answered that prayer, God answered that prayer, God answered that prayer. That prayer may not have gone the way I want it to. But I see God's faithfulness in so many areas that it becomes easier when I'm looking back on, on these moments of saying, okay, right now I'm not hearing the answer I want to hear or not the timing that I want to hear it at, but I know God is present because I've seen it before and I'll see it again. And so just, and even in scripture, we see this, you know, with Jonah in the belly of the fish, with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the the fiery furnace, with Daniel in the lion's den, David when he's facing Goliath, like in these really crazy moments that must be scary and frightening and feel very alone, feel like they're completely outside of God's will we see God's presence there. And so I, it, it does help to remind us of those moments. I think the other weakness for me sometimes in thinking of God's presence is when everything's going well, mm-hmm. I just ignore God's presence or become numb to it, that it's there, but I forget that to acknowledge that and to receive that. And so, you know, that can be equally as bad as in those, those difficult times, not recognizing it. I agree. And uh, to go over the journal part a little bit, I guess somebody was sharing that with me on Sunday about how they were reading back on their journal and finding something that God had come through for them and they're going through a rough time, kind of what you were saying. And I don't journal all the time, but I do try to journal and I would kind of call it a prayer journal. But I think part of for people is it's a it's a personal thing between you and God. You can write in it what you want, but it is a good way to see God's faithfulness and that his presence has always been there. Um, yeah, I heard someone, I don't remember who, I think, I think a friend of mine had, had said this, that they, I think every night, write kind of the ways they saw God moving that day, and then they put it in some sort of bowl, and then like at the end of the year, they pull all these notes out and just see God's faithfulness throughout the year and and are just reminded of that as they go into a new year of worshiping God and following him. So there's lots of ways to do it, but we need to remember the hope of the gospel for ourselves, for our own faith walk, but also because it helps us to share that with others. It does. And so Jonah's in a really dark place. So why do you think he finally reached out to God? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting moment because it seems like, you know, when he's thrown overboard, he seems to be accepting that he's going to die and willing to do that to avoid Nineveh. And here in the belly of the fish, I mean, I, I think it's kind of just so extreme that at some point he's like, yeah, I messed up. I mean, it's just so obvious and, and depressing and painful. And I, I don't know what it was like, but I mean, I just... I started the other day trying to picture this, and I imagine you can't really see anything. There's just, I mean, it's not like there's a light on in the belly of the fish, <laughs> and you're in the depths of the sea, and I, I just imagine it's not comfortable, it's painful, and you're just sitting there thinking, my life's going to end. I mean, it just is not a good moment. I think sometimes we have to come to the very end of ourselves to recognize all that God is doing and our need for him and, and all those other things. And so I just think this is one of those moments where Jonah is is forced to come to the end of himself and realize, yep, I messed up. I can't do this on my own. My plan does not work. This is bad. God's in control, and I need to do whatever he calls me to do just because of his power. But he also seems to acknowledge his love and mercy and grace in there as well. And so I, I think it's just a reality of you probably wouldn't have asked me to do this if it wasn't good for me. And again, I'd rather go to Nineveh and preach to people that I don't want to preach to than sit in the belly of a fish and watch my life fade away in this horrible fashion. Mm-hmm. So he, he recognized who God was, and then he's down there. He's talking to God, so he's praying. I think sometimes I'm reminded, too, that I should be praying. You know, maybe if he had prayed about not wanting to go to Nineveh, maybe things could have been different if he had poured out his heart to God instead of just acting, at least for me. Um, He's praying now when he gets to the end of himself, and I'm trying to catch myself before things get so bleak. I don't want to end up in the belly of the whale. Um, I want to see God working and notice his presence places. But he sees 
who God is, you used one of the, um, you, you used a lot of great scripture, but one of them there you talked about um, was in Second Chronicles. Mm -hmm. And I love those scriptures. Um, tell me a little bit more about them, why you use them. Yeah, so in Second Chronicles, Solomon's built the temple. He's dedicating the temple to God, and he prays this prayer. And essentially, as part of it, he asks God, he says, hey, we as your people are going to sin, and when we do, we will be judged for our sin. He's not blaming God. He's not saying this won't be fair. He's saying it's because of our sin that we might be given over into the hands of our enemies and taken away from this place. And he says, when that happens, if we repent and we turn our hearts away from our sin, away from ourselves, and turn our hearts towards you and turn our eyes towards you, and he uses the temple as that imagery of this is where we're going to turn because this is your presence. This is where we make sacrifices. So if we turn our eyes, we're turning our, if we turn our eyes physically towards the temple, we're turning our, eye, our, our heart spiritually towards you. Then will you forgive us? And God says, yes. Like he, he, by the way, God ignores the temple part because I don't think they need to physically turn towards the temple. God cares about the heart. And so he says, yes, if your heart's turned back towards me, then I'll forgive you and bring you back into your land. And again, it just shows God's pursuit of us and his heart for us that even when we are lost, he is coming after us. As Romans says, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And so God's pursuing us, and all we have to do is receive that and accept that and turn away from our own ways. And as Jonah says, turn away from our idols, because those, when we run after those, we're running away from God's love. So turn away from the idols and the things of this world, which we're going to talk a little bit more about next week, but then turn towards God's love and receive him. And that's just what this, this idea, as Jonah says, I'm going to turn towards the temple, it points back to this passage in Chronicles of when your people turn back towards you, repent of their sins, turn towards you, will you receive them? And God says, yes, of course. God is a forgiving God, and he forgives sins over and over and over and over again. And, and then you went on, and it talks about in verse 6 of, of the Jonah chapter 2, about it's his grace then, that that's why he does it, because he is full of grace. Um, so you used, you, you had awesome scriptures there and I had somebody new ask me, um, they didn't have a Bible. So, uh, what would you encourage people? These are great scriptures for people to look up. Are these things we can claim now too? Yeah. I mean, certainly some of them, you always have to be a little bit careful with like promises of God and, and as you're paying attention, because there are some that are very specific to a specific person or a specific time frame or different things. But there are a lot that we can look at and say, yes, these are true. I mean, Jesus saying with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This is a salvation moment. And it's the rich young ruler who goes away because he has too much wealth. And so they're saying, well, who can be saved? And he says, with man, it's impossible, but with God, it's possible. And so it doesn't mean that you can jump up and fly with God. Like that's just, I mean, I guess you could if you wanted you to, but probably not going to happen. He's not giving you, you know, those kind of superpowers or whatever. Or well, we can't claim it for the 49ers. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot, of, a lot of athletes will try and do that. Like, oh, with God, all, th all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a Super Bowl champion just because you prayed a prayer and said, Jesus, please let me do this. Um, maybe it does. I don't know. But again, probably not, probably not the right, right context for that. So it's really about living in God's will and doing what he has called us to do typically is the way we want to receive these promises. But to the Bible question, yes, I think, I think getting a, a good Bible and, you know, any, any basic Bible that has the word of God is going to be a good start. There are a couple things I'll, I'll quickly run through because it's always good for people to acknowledge. First of all, there's a lot of things online. So if you're someone who wants to get online and do them or on an app, there's some great resources. YouVersion Bible app, I use that every day. And I use that for a Bible reading plan that gets me through the Bible in a year. We actually have over a hundred people from our church who are participating in a read through the Bible plan in a year right now and all doing it together in that app, which is really fun. And I'm behind, but I'm still in the group. That's okay. It happens. And my encouragement from the beginning is do something, do a little bit of something if you can every single day. And you know, if you're not caught up, that's okay. God's got grace. We do too. So, you know, just, it's important just to be reading scripture. I have a student, this is separate, uh, a, well, a former student of mine, but she's a student here 
And she's texting me every time she's done with one of uh, a book of the Bible and says, which one should I read next? Oh, so wow. I'm just giving her kind of random books, makes sense in my head somewhat, but directing her through scripture, not exactly linear through, you know, Genesis to Revelation, but just giving her different things to try and move her through. So there's different ways of doing it is the point. But the YouVersion Bible app is a great resource. BibleGateway.com online is a great resource, has some, some study tools as well on there. And also, if you want to go a little bit deeper, one thing I'll recommend is the Bible Project, which has great videos. So if you're going to start like in the book of Jonah or you're going to start, I'm reading through Job in the Bible reading plan right now. Job is kind of a confusing book. So the Bible Project has a video on Job that does these really cool illustrations and talks about what's happening in the context of it. So it helps you understand as you read. Those videos can also be found on our Right Now Media page, which you can go to cccnow.com and find our link to our Right Now Media. And that's a great resource. That's tons of videos for kids, adults, groups, Bible studies, all different things that are on there. So if you're trying to look for some deeper study and you want to do sort of a video content, use our Right Now Media page. You can have a free account through Christ Community. So those are all great things. The Bible itself, um, Again, a study Bible, I like life application study Bible. I think especially beginner, it's a, it's a really good practical tool that helps say, okay, how do I take the scripture and actually do something with it? Mm -hmm. And so those are nice. And then you want to look always at the translation too. We use NIV as our primary in, uh, in services and different things like that. It's a nice, easy read. There's the ESV if you want a more literal word for word. So they take the original wording, the Greek or the Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament, and will literally translate the word. And so it can feel a little clunky at times, maybe a harder read, but probably a more accurate picture, the ESV, NASB, King James. Those are kind of the more like word for word ones. And then NIV more moves more towards the, they take the idea and try and help write it in a way that's easier to read. Christian Standard Bible, CSB is a good one. NLT is a little bit far on that side, but that's kind of one of those. And if you like the message, the message I would say is more of a commentary than a Bible translation, but it can be helpful in your Bible reading. So there's your uh, helpful Bible techniques for today. Well, and for anybody bringing a friend, uh, the Welcome Center has free Bibles for new people or anybody that just needs to pick up a Bible. They're simple paperbacks, but um, great to get started. So you used, uh, the Bible's full of this grace, mm -hmm. and that's, you used some of these verses there. Um, and one of the things that, w that you ended up talking about was the prodigal son, and that really talked about the grace of God. Can you expand on that a little more? Yeah, I, I think, you know, last week we talked about the shepherd and the lost sheep and and we skipped through the lost coin. If you're in our small groups, then you probably went through this in the Jonah study. It was, you know, read through all like 15. But the prodigal son is, is a great example of really when we start to turn back towards God, we see him running towards us. And so it's, it's almost that, that the lost sheep or the lost coin, you know, we're, we're not seeing them turning back. We're just seeing them picked up and brought back. And so we see the heart of the father and that's important, that's happening. But the, the prodigal son, speaks about, you know, the son, he was just so broken and lost and he did his own thing. He abandoned his father. He won the father's stuff, not the father. I mean, we live this out in our lives all the time where we love creation and the created world and different things, the relationships we can have here, but we don't want God. And then there comes this moment where we're like, oh, life would be better with God. But sometimes we feel I don't deserve that. And, and, and where do I go? And the prodigal son shows us that as the son returned to ask if he could be a servant, the father ran towards him and pulled him in embrace and welcomed him warmly and threw a party and a celebration and was just so excited because his son was back. And he didn't welcome him as a servant. He welcomed him back as a son. And I think that's the way that God sees us and loves us is that he wants to call us son or daughter and welcome us in with open arms. And so when we repent, turn away from our sins, turn towards God, we're going to see him running towards us, waiting to welcome us with open arms, calling us son or daughter. So Jonah got to see the grace and mercy of God by the fish spitting him up as well. And that might not have felt as comfortable as looking at, oh, look at what God did for me. But it really saved Jonah's life. It gave him the next part another chance for life to say yes to God. 
Um, do you think sometimes maybe we don't see God's grace? Yeah, and I think that grace can sometimes be painful. It can come in difficult moments, difficult circumstances. And you think about God's grace was there in the storm. It was there with the sailors kind of yelling at Jonah, trying to get him to figure things out. It was there when they threw him overboard. It was there with the fish. It was there with him being sped out. Like all of that is an example of God's grace moving in Jonah's life. And so I do think there are situations in life that we, that we are ignoring or that we're complaining about, that we're fighting about, that we're frustrated about. And it really might be something. I mean, anything that points us to Christ is God's grace. And, and, you know, I can't think of a story off the top of my head, but I know there are people who have gone through some really hard things and look and say, I, w- I wouldn't change that for the world because this pointed me to the path of knowing Christ. And that's a really hard thing to do. And in the moment, it doesn't feel that way. But ultimately, the greatest gift we can receive is the gift of Christ and deep relationship with him. And so anything that points us in that direction is actually a really powerful act. But yeah, we can miss it. And that's why I think we want to pay attention to scripture and we want to pay attention to what God's doing and, and stop and pause and say, what has God done today? What has God done this month? What has God done this year? Because mm-hmm. it just helps to, to reset our hearts and, and maybe kind of put on the glasses that will help us to see what God is really doing. Well, and part of how you ended your message is, and then sharing that with others, mm-hmm. because you talked about Jonah jumping up and down, like, look at what God just did for him. Um, and one of the questions in our study guide talked about what we do with good news. Like if our team wins or, you know, there's something great, we share it. We need to share what Jesus has done for us every day. And so I liked that encouragement. Is there any part that you would close us with that you wanted to say more on? Well, let me just, let me just repeat that. Last night I watched the 49ers play. They won. Me, my brother, my, my two boys, and my two two of my nephews um we went running outside and ran around my my street just screaming like we're going to the super bowl oh no just for fun it's fine it's fine we're okay i don't think the neighbors hate me yet and but we went we went you know celebrating and didn't care who hurt the 49ers winning is fun it'll last for a little while if they win the super bowl i'll be excited for a couple days a couple weeks maybe you know but then a new game you know new season starts and it's you, you start all over our relationship with Christ is so much better than the, the best news that we can possibly think of here in this world. And there's nothing that compares. And I know that this, this is a challenge for me, that I have been in church so long and I've, I've been around religion and rules and, and church and Christians and all these people and, and the culture and everything else, that I sometimes forget the simple truth that we know the best news ever that we know that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I've received that. I have eternal life to look forward to. And so often I overcomplicate it. And that's why I assume there are others who are like me. Maybe I'm the only one, but I'm sure there are others. And so just my encouragement to us as a church is to remember the good news and to share the good news and to be excited about it. Find that joy in it again. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't live in fear but live in the joy that God has given to us in knowing Jesus Christ and share that gift with others. Great thing for this week and on. Yes, absolutely. And again, evangelism, don't overcomplicate it. Just share what God has done for you and who Jesus is. And I think that will be impactful in our families, our homes, our cities, our world. Thank so, you. Yeah, join us on Sunday, 9 a.m. or 1045 a.m. in the multi-purpose room for contemporary services. 10 a.m. for traditional, or you can watch online at 10 a.m. or 10.45 a.m. And make sure you're going through your studies this week, and we will see you next time.